My name is Pastor Hal York, and we'd like to welcome you to our online service at Hastings Park Bible Church. This is April the 18th, and we're glad you could join us online. We will be having in-person in services today. As we know, the uh, government restrictions have heightened as of Monday. We're only allowed 10 people indoors or outdoors uh, until this uh, lo lockdown order is rescinded. And so that basically means we won't be having morning services evening services or prayer meeting for the next few weeks uh, until that uh, restriction is lifted because there's not much we can do with just 10 people per service. So uh, be in prayer for that. We were saddened by that. We were hoping we were beyond those uh, restrictions. They wouldn't be coming out again, but uh, they are, and we just need to pray that the numbers continue to go down and uh, we will be able to have in-person services again very soon. We will, soon, but we will be having them this week. And then after that, we'll let you know, post it on the Facebook page and our web page as far as when the restrictions uh, are lifted. So we're hoping that won't be too far down the road. <clears throat> but we're glad you've joined us. And we know that God is building his church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. COVID's not going to prevail against it. And so we are excited to see what God is going to do in our church and is doing in our church. Uh, we are encouraged as we see people coming. We are encouraged as we see people supporting and just when we do get together, how excited people are to be together. And we know that many of you are longing to, for that day when you can come back and we can all join together and lift up the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we're just uh, looking for, forward to that day. We trust you, trust you are as well. And just be in prayer for our church and for other churches in the area that we will continue to be faithful and that you would watch over God's people. The offices will be open. I'm here most, most days uh, during the week. If you'd like to come in and talk or just chat, and uh, just somebody to talk to, be more than happy to do that. You can call to make sure I am here. Uh, but I'm here most days, so I'd be love, to have you, love to have you just drop in and pay a visit if you'd like. But we want to make sure we're meeting your needs and ministering to you as best that we can in these difficult days. And so just don't, be, has, don't hesitate to call and let us know if there's something we can do for you. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your great grace and mercy. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have, Lord, through this technology, Lord, to, to, to study your word together. We know it's not the same as being together, but we know in how important it is that we are together whenever we can be, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But we know that, Lord, that there's a lot going on, and we're waiting for this virus to uh, dissipate and for this vaccines to be ramped up again and so we just pray lord you'll in these difficult days lord just be with each one who was lonely who was struggling and uh, just anxious we just pray lord that you might just quieten our hearts for these few moments together and, and remind us of who you are remind us of your faithfulness to us and remind us you never leave us nor forsake us and we are truly never alone and so bless our time together we pray in jesus name we ask amen
Romans 6, 12-23 Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its less. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, For you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from those things of which you were now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May God bless the reading of his word. I trust you had an opportunity to hum along or sing along with those songs. And the scripture that was read, I trust it was meaningful to to you. We'll be coming back to that in a few moments. But let's just look to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing upon our time in the word. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your majesty, for your greatness, that we are called to be still and to know that you are God. And that's not always just a, a, an invitation, Lord, to stop moving around physically. It's an invitation, Lord, for in our, in our inner man to be still, to be quiet. The thoughts and the cares and the worries, Lord, that drown out any thoughts of you. May we just be still in our hearts. May we be focused in our minds and be reminded anew of who you are. And as we study your word, we pray that you would just through your spirit open our heart and our mind to its truth and remind us again of who you are and all you've done for us through Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross. And so, Father, we thank you that you are here with us and your spirit indwells us who know you and that we can understand your word so open our eyes and our heart to your word tonight today and and we pray lord for those who are not well we think of karen and blair and karen scribbins and bring your hand of healing continue to be upon her we thank you for the uh the good report for the last few weeks and but we just pray she's going through rehab that you'll just continue to strengthen her in her body and and that she might be very soon be able to get home and and we want to pray also for others lord we think of norm who's gone through a uh surgery uh, recently we pray as he's recovering from that that you would uh, watch over him and uh, we just pray lord for others who have recently gone through surgeries that you'll be, be with them and they're back and pray for lee coming who's home now i believe we're coming home on wednesday we pray that you'll be with he and Marilyn, and may you ease his back pain and we know that there are many who suffer from chronic pain and and we pray that you might be near to them and watch over them But we thank you, Lord, above all, that you are building your church and you are working in your people. You never stop working in your people. That work you started when we began our walk with you through faith in Jesus Christ, you will complete it. And one day we will be home with you and we will see you face to face and we will be like you for we will see you as you truly are. And the growth process will be over. It will be complete. And we thank you for that glorious hope that we have in Christ and Lord, we're living in a world filled with hopelessness and despair and fear, and it's everywhere, and it's, it's causing, Lord, people to, to despair. But we pray, Lord, that we would not lose heart, that we would continually be encouraged, remembering that our God truly reigns, our God sits in the heavens, and he does as he pleases, because you are God. 
And you reign and you rule. And you do all things according to the counsel of your will. And you take care of your people. You are a shepherd. And you lead us. Even through the valley of the shadow of death, you remind us you're not just leading us, you're with us. And so we thank you, Lord, for that you never leave your people, you never forsake us, and that you are continually to working and encouraging us and working in us to make us more Christ-like and to be a light in this dark, dark world. And so we thank you for this book of 1 Peter that shows us how we can do that, that reminds us of who we are and, and what you're doing in us and through us, and that we can be an example and a light to this people without hope, living in just despair and loneliness and uncertainty. We thank you, Lord, that we know who we are, we know who you are, most importantly, and we know how this world is going to end, and that you're going to come back one day, and you're going to rule and reign on this earth, and we're going to be ruling and reigning with you, and what a joyful hope and that is, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with you, to be that home that you've prepared for us. And so, Lord, our hope never fades. Our hope is eternal. And so, Father, we just pray that we would live like people who have hope, and who have joy and peace, not based on our circumstances, but based on our walk and our, your work in our life and all you've done for us in our life, that we have the joy of knowing our sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. May that joy just permeate our hearts and just give us a, a new song, put a new song in our mouth, even praise to our God. It made us a new creation. You put our feet upon a rock, and that rock is Jesus Christ. So we thank you that we can know we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so we pray, Lord, that now that you would just open our hearts and our minds to your word, and may we study it and, and seek through your spirit understand it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you have your Bibles, we've been doing a series in the book of 1 Peter, and we're going to jump back into that series again uh, this morning or today. And we're 1 Peter chapter 4. Verses 1 through 6, we want to look at today, and I trust there will be a blessing to you. We, last week, we remember, we looked at, uh, we looked at the subject that this world is not our friend. And it certainly goes along with what First Peter has been telling us. But we want to consider these verses because I think they're very important and very meaningful, as you'll see as we go through them. But Peter, as we know, is writing to believers, believers who have been suffering under persecution, not because of a disease or not because of anything else, but because they were Christians. That's the only reason they were suffering. And we're, going to, we're, we're getting close to the point in our Christian life, in this culture that we're living in, where we're going to be suffering not because of COVID or not, not because of anything else, but we're going to be suffering and being ostracized and maybe even worse simply because we claim to be Christians simply because we believe the word of God and we believe in Jesus Christ and when he and who he is and because of their persecution they've been scattered they're suffering unjustly for being righteous and Peter is writing to these people so they will know how to face such trials victoriously and with the proper attitude and focus and that's been his what he's been doing and will be continuing to do through this whole letter. Weaving in and out of who we are as believers, he keeps coming back to that so we don't forget. Remember who you are in this world. We are aliens and pilgrims, strangers and pilgrims in this world. This world is not our home. That our identity is in Christ. But Christ has done for us on the cross, reminding us we are strangers and pilgrims. And at the very outset, he gives us some very tremendous truths to encourage their hearts. He doesn't promise them their good, best life now, and you'll get back what the devil is stolen from. You know, you look at what he says in verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter at the very outset is reminding us of who we are in Christ, of what God has done for us and is doing for us, what we have that the world can never take away from us as believers. And in so doing, he's reminding us how we are to live. 
and who we are to live for, what attitudes we should maintain in our life. Should we be fighting back? Should we, how do we deal with those who persecute us, who malign us and mock us? What should our attitudes be towards the government, towards authority, towards our boss, and so on? Chapter 2, he deals with that. But it's a very relevant book. It's a very practical book. And Peter has reminded us several times that Christ suffered in this world. And he suffered for righteousness, and he suffered as a sacrifice for our sin on the cross. And that's how he begins chapter 4. Let me just read these first six verses to get us started today. It says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, or no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, of lusts, of drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to to the will of God. So I said, this letter is written to believers, followers of Jesus Christ, people who have been born again by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God. And he calls us to be willing and ready to face persecution for righteousness' sake, and even if necessary, martyrdom for Jesus Christ. His call for us is to persevere, is to be strong. It's to be prepared, it's to be faithful, and it's to shine as lights in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation, as Philippians tells us in chapter 2. I think Hebrews 12 gives us a wonderful picture of what Peter is trying to paint for us in this letter. The writer of Hebrews says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary, fainting at heart. And I think that's what Peter is telling us in these verses we're going to look at today. Do not grow weary. Do not faint. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. And that's what he says in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh or in his body, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Arm yourselves with the same purpose. Well, the key phrase that we're going to be looking at today is in verse 1. Arm yourselves. Arm yourselves. That, we know what that word means. It's a, it's a military term. It means to get ready. It means to get ready for battle. It means to literally arm yourself with weapons or put on as armor what you need to fight this battle. But before we arm ourselves for battle, we need to be aware of some certain things. Number one, we should be aware that we are even in a conflict. There's some people that act like they don't know that. There's some Christians that act like they're shocked. They're shocked by conflict. They're shocked by mocking. They're shocked by persecution. They're shocked by temptation in their own life. But we should expect conflict. We should expect that we're in a war. We're in a battle. Paul said, I have fought the good fight, which means Paul understood that the Christian life is a battle. That the Christian life is a battle. We are in a war, a spiritual war. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. He was preparing his disciples. In the world you are going to have, he doesn't say you might have, he says you will have, you will suffer persecution. Paul said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Not maybe, but it will happen. We will have it. And so we need to expect conflict, or we will never get armed. 
we don't expect it. We'll, we'll always be caught off guard. We'll never see it coming. I mean, you go into a battle and you never see it coming, you know you're going to be in a, it's going to be a short fight because you'll be defeated very quickly. So we should always be armed. We should always be armed. We should know who the enemy is. 1 Peter chapter 5 tells us, Be sober, of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him, firm in your faith. Ephesians 6.11, Put on the, whole, the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the, sp the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we need to be always be armed because we know who our enemy is. It's the evil one. It's Satan himself. It's the principalities of this the, the world forces of this darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We stand against the schemes of the wilds of the devil. So we should always be armed because the devil never lets up. He's our enemy. He's always there. He's always ready to tempt. We go on vacation. We don't leave the devil behind. We go to church. We do not leave the devil behind. The battle is a constant battle. We must always be armed because the conflict never eases. It never lets up. It never lets up. But we should also know the weapons that we need for such a conflict. There's an old saying that goes, you don't take a knife to a gunfight. And the same thing's true spiritually. Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the tearing down of strongholds. As we tear down speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and every, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and are ready to punish all disobedience, Whenever your obedience is fulfilled, we cannot live the Christian life in our own strength. We cannot defeat the enemy in our own strength. It is impossible. We cannot defeat the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, or the lust of the flesh with our own wit, with our own willpower, or by worldly wisdom. To put those things on and think we can do battle against temptation and, and sin and everything else going on around us and, and in us, is to put on Saul's armor, as David tried to do when he fought Goliath. Saul gave him his armor, and it didn't fit. He was clanging around. He says, I can't fight in this. I'm a dead man. And so we need to take on the full armor of God, Paul says in Ephesians 6, 13, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. That we need to stand firm, and that's an exciting term, to stand the Christian stands on the victory that Christ has already won. We're standing firm, having girded our loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and shod, having feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition, having taken the shield of faith with, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Also receive the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, praying at all times with all prayer and petition in the Spirit to this end, being on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Arm yourselves. Be on alert. And sadly, so many today are not armed and they're half asleep. They have no idea that they are in a battle, that they're in a war. And if you, have, if you have no idea you're in a battle or in a war, you're already lost. You're already lost. Another thing we need to know is we should know where this conflict will be, this conflict will be fought. Romans 7, 1 says, I find then the principle that in me evil is present, in me who, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in my members waging war against the law of my mind and making me a captive to the law of sin which is in my members. 
O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with the mind serve the law of God, but on the other with my flesh the law of sin. It's a battle that takes place on the inner man, in our minds, in our hearts. But we also need to know something else. Know that the outcome has already been won. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, Galatians 5, 16. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you do not do the things that you want. Christ always leads us in victory, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 says. Christ has won the victory. He has defeated Satan. He has crushed the serpent's head. And we should know that we live, we come in our, we live our Christian life from a standpoint of victory. The victory of Jesus Christ who has won it for us. And we'll say more about that in a minute. But we should also know what this conflict is about. It's about righteousness. It's about God's glory. It's about obedience. Listen to what Peter says in chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, glor- as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. He says in verse 8 of chapter 3, to sum up, All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. So we don't have to wonder what the purpose of this fight, what the goal of the fight is. is, It's godliness, it's holiness, it's Christ-likeness, it's God's glory. So we should know that Jesus suffered in his body, in his flesh. He suffered at the hands of men because he was righteous. When we think about the life of Christ, when we think about the cross of Jesus Christ, when we see how men treated Jesus Christ, the the God-man, the incarnation of God, Emmanuel, God with us, is who Christ was. He was God in the flesh, and he came down to this earth. And when we see how man treated him, we see the epitome of the sinfulness and the depravity of the human heart. They beat him, they mocked him, they spat upon him, they put a crown of thorns on his head, they crucified him, and they demonstrated that man was hopelessly lost. He was in total bondage to sin, he was a slave to sin, he was a hater of God, a hater of righteousness, he was not seeking after God. And Jesus came to his own, and they rejected him. Why? Because he was righteous. And he exposed the hypocrisy and the sinfulness of their hearts. And they would not repent. They would not bow their knee. And so they nailed him to the cross to get rid of him. To get rid of him. Acts 2.23 says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan of foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Man at his worst was demonstrated at the cross. How they treated the perfect, righteous, spotless Son of God. They nailed him to a cross who never sinned, who never knew no sin, he did no sin. A simple word never uttered crossed his lips, and they crucified him. But we also know something else, that when Jesus hung on the cross, God was doing something as well. Jesus came here to save his people from their sin. That's what they call his name, Jesus. And he knew exactly what would happen. He was delivered up, as we said, Acts says, by the determined Definite plan and foreknowledge of God, how these men treated him was not a surprise. He knew what would happen when he, that's why he came. He was a lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. God, but God poured out his wrath 
that I deserved on, my, on his only son. And he died for my sin as he hung on the cross for those three hours from midday to three o'clock in the afternoon. God poured out his wrath on his only begotten son. The wrath I deserved, you deserved. And he suffered for sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We all know that verse. And this is why Jesus came to this earth. Chapter 3, verse 18 of 1 Peter, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Jesus Christ came into this world to die as a sacrifice for sin. When Peter says, arm yourself with the same attitude, he's talking about Jesus' willingness to suffer for righteousness. Obviously, our suffering does not have a saving element to it. But men are going to treat us the same way they treated Jesus Christ. If they hated you, Jesus, me, Jesus said, they're going to hate you as well. And they hated Jesus because of his righteousness. And we see at the cross of Jesus Christ, man at his worst and God at his best if you will, if you want to put it like that. Man in his total depravity, signifying, crucifying the Son of God, perfect Son of God, and God in his grace and his mercy and his holiness, sending his Son and laying on his Son all our iniquity and punishing it for three hours, pouring out his wrath on his infinite son, and he bore an infinite wrath for all of us who know him. And what a glorious picture that is. Man at his worst, his hatred, and God showing his love towards those who were crucifying him, towards mankind who rejected and rebelled against him. And I trust you've come to that cross and you've found that joy of because we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, what Christ did for us on the cross alone. Christ died for you and for me. And the only way we can accept that is through faith. We can't earn it. We merit it. It was by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And we receive it by faith alone, putting our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. But the attitude Peter wants us to draw us to is the fact that Christ willingly suffered for righteousness sake. There was no, there's no suffering, there's no, nothing in my suffering that saves or ha adds anything to my salvation, obviously. Christ has borne all of that. But Jesus' attitude in his suffering is in chapter 2, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose. It's amazing how many times we see that word for purpose, purpose, purpose. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his step. Arm yourselves with that same purpose, for verse 1 says. That same purpose. Jesus' attitude was to be faithful to the Father no matter what, knowing that the cross comes before the crown. This was not a new concept. Jesus taught this while he was here on earth in Luke 9, 23, verses we probably know very well. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And basically, to take up your cross means you're willing to die. Be willing to die for Christ. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses my, his life for my sake will save it. So to arm ourselves, as verse 1 says, is to arm ourselves with the same purpose, is to take up our cross daily, which means be prepared to suffer, be willing to suffer, and be prepared to die. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me, Jesus said, is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Verse 24, chapter 2. He says, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. The words he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin is what Peter's alluding to in verse 24. So that we might die to sin. 
It speaks of the believer's desire to know more sin. When Christ died on the cross for us, something happened to us in our, in our sin's dominion over us, as we're going to see. We entered into a new relationship, a new identification with Christ, which gives us the power and the motivation not to sin. For the believer who's come to know Jesus Christ, we no longer long to sin, want to sin. We hate sin. We love righteousness. We long to obey God and follow him and live holy lives. And when we sin, we confess our sin. But our desire is to live for Christ, to live righteously, to turn from sin, to serve the living and the true God. And it's all because of our union with Christ through faith. We become a new creation. We have a new nature. The Holy Spirit now lives within us and works powerfully in us. We're no longer slaves to sin, but we have the ability to resist sin and live victoriously through the power of the Holy Spirit living in every believer. And we need to realize that. Verse 2 is a very important verse in the Christian life. It talks about a very important principle that I think a lot of Christians don't understand. Or if they do, they don't think about it. Because if, you're think, if you long to live a Christian life, these verses are going to excite you that we're going to look at right now. If you long to glorify God in your life, if you long to, to live a life that is free from sin or, or Love, in love of righteousness and you want to be growing in your Christian life, we never get to the point where we're completely free of sin, obviously. We won't be there until we see Christ face to face and we become like him. But the, our, we have a constant battle with it, but we can, have a, we, we can be growing in sanctification. We can be growing in godliness. We can be growing in holiness. We are perfectly righteous. We are perfectly holy in our standing before God because we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that will never change. Nothing we do on this earth adds or takes away from that. But it should be our desire, that new heart that we're given, that new life that we're given, a desire to live for Jesus Christ, a desire to live for God, a desire to, be, to live out the Christian life, to be filled with the fruits of the Spirit, to live a Christ-like life. And we're able to do that because of what Christ accomplished for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. Colossians 1.28 says, and 29, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, Paul says, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. And that's true of you too, if you know Christ. The Holy Spirit lives within you. The moment we become a Christian, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our life. And he begins a work, Philippians says, he who began a good work will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ, and that will never stop. He works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The Spirit of God begins a work in you, and it is a powerful work, and it is an ongoing work that never ends. And is, he continually works powerfully in all of us. And because of that, we can rejoice in these verses that I want to read for you right now. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sins. He's talking about Christ. Now he's talking about us. Therefore, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or knows him. Now here he's not talking about little sins. He's talking about habitual sin, living in habitual sin, carrying on in a lifestyle of sin. No one who keep, abides in him keeps on habitually sinning. We are going to sin, and we confess it, but there's been a change in our behavior. The little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he, as he is righteous. We long to practice righteousness. Whoever makes a practice or habitually practices sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. It doesn't say he should not keep on sinning. It says he cannot. And these are very powerful verses. And the verses mean exactly what they say. They don't mean what we want them to say. They mean what they say. 
He's not talking about some super spiritual Christian who's been saved for 75 years. What he's talking about here is true of every believer. He's not talking to disciples, the 12 disciples here. John is writing a letter to people in church just like this, just like you and I. We have been set free from sin. And so that's what he says in verse 2, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the will of God. To understand this, we need to jump back to some wonderful verses in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And I want to just say this as you're turning there, that if this subject bores you or doesn't interest you, it's safe to say that you are not armed for battle. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that maybe you're not a believer at all. Because these are front-line verses. If you are longing to live a life that's pleasing to God, if you are longing to live a life that shines in the light of, that shines in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation, if you are longing to grow in Christ's likeness, then you sh- this subject should be on first thing you think about when you get up in the morning. I'm dead to sin. I'm no longer a slave to sin. Romans 6, chapter 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Every true believer is regenerated by the Holy Spirit and has victory over sin, as we just read in 1 John chapter Romans 6. It's achieved not by a process or by striving or working to, to that end. It's achieved by our union with Christ and the regenerating grace of the Spirit of God. This is our standing in Christ. He says in chapter 6, verse 5, Or verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? He's talking here about the the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. We died with Christ and we were resurrected with Christ. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that Christ was raised from the dead, the dead through the glory of God, so that we might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. Then he says in verse 11, Even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its love, lust. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. These are glorious verses. And these verses should excite us if we're serious about living the Christian life. If we're serious about living a life that glorifies and lifts up our Savior Jesus Christ. Sin does not have mastery over the believer. That doesn't mean he doesn't sin, but it means that the old man died, our old nature died. We have a new nature, a new life in Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. The body of sin, still, the flesh still clings us to us. I've heard it expressed as the, it's sort of like a dead man draped over the body. It's still there. But there's a total difference between surviving sin and reigning sin. This is where striving in the battle and the war takes place. We're going to see if you, when we did our study of Romans, when we get to chapter 7, we see the struggle Paul had with the flesh that still clings to him. And we can all relate to chapter 7 very much. So the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. That's the struggle of every believer. But then he says at the end of that great chapter, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the other hand, I myself serve the mind. With my mind, I'm serving the law of God. But on the other, with my mind, the law of sin. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? Jesus Christ. In him we have victory. But there's a difference between surviving sin and reigning sin. Sin is still in the house. 
our body of flesh. It's still loud, and it still wants you to think he's in control. And it screams and he yells, says, you got to do this, i got to have this. But he isn't. You've been set free. All he can do is yell and tempt. But sin is no longer our master. We've been set free. The chains have fallen off. We as believers need to know that sin does not have dominion over us. We do not sin because we have to. We sin because we want to. We don't have to sin. That forces, the forces of redeeming, regenerating, sanctifying grace have been brought to bear upon every believer's life. And the result of that is a changed life, a transformed life, a life that is transforming and becoming more like Christ day in and day out. And so he says in verse 12, Do not obey, therefore, sinful passions and desires. And some people say, yeah, but they're so real and they're so powerful. Yes, they are. And you say, I can't help it, but yes, where you're wrong. That's where you're wrong. You can't help it. But remember this, that all sin is addictive. All sin is enslaving, not just drugs and alcohol. All sin is addictive. Why is it addictive? Because the flesh is never satisfied. It always wants more. All sin is enslaving. But Paul says that has been broken through the death of Christ, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can have a newness of life, and we have newness of life. We walk in the power of a resurrected Christ. We walk in the power of a spirit living within us who works powerfully in us. All flesh is addictive. All sin is addictive. The flesh is never satisfied. But Paul says through the Scripture and the Holy Spirit who lives within us, you can be set free. You can be set free. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but it does mean that progress in the Christian life is possible and expected. You can grow in grace and holiness. As we've said many times, and I'm quoting others who've said it before me, it's not the perfection of our life, but the direction of our life. That when you become a Christian, change is 180 degrees. You were serving idols, but now you're turned and you're serving the living and the true God. It's a 180 degree turn. You were living for sin, but now you're living for righteousness. You were living for self, but now you're living for Christ and others. God is working in us powerfully. But again, the key is remembering who we are in Christ. We have a vital, living, powerful union with Jesus Christ. And so instead of presenting ourselves as instruments to sin, we now present ourselves, we should present ourselves as instruments of righteousness, as he says in verse 13. And do not go on presenting members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of God to righteousness, for sin shall not be master over you. Paul's motivation was to encourage holiness, was not law, but grace. We obey not in order to get saved or to earn merit, but because we are already saved. Salvation is unto good works, it's not by good works. Our obedience on this life adds nothing to our salvation. We are saved by the perfect righteousness and perfect works of Christ. Works are an evidence of Christ in us. They're an evidence of genuine saving faith. So if you're struggling to be the husband, the wife, the parent, the believer, the Christian God wants you to be as a parent, you're struggling with sin or habits that seem impossible to break, Jesus said after he raised Lazarus, loose him and let him go. And the moment you were born again, the chains of sin fell off your life. You were no longer a slave to sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you. By the power of the Spirit of God living in you, you can live a victorious Christian life. You were not a slave to sin. You were in Christ, and he is your new master. 
these verses remind us of the inward, personal, powerful, purposeful work of God going on right now in every believer. Growing in godliness is a powerful, progressive sanctification that's happening in every believer's life. Philippians 1.6 tells us that. So suffering in the flesh weakens the flesh. The more we say no to the flesh and selfish desire and pursuits, the weaker the flesh gets. Whoever we feed is going to win the battle. The more we indulge the flesh, the stronger it gets. If we deny it by feeding upon the Word of God, by prayer, and strengthening the inner man, the heart and the mind, denying ourselves, taking up our cross, mortifying the flesh, putting it to death, our flesh gets weaker and our sanctification becomes more evident as we walk in the power of a spirit-led life. And these are verses that you need to chew on digest and think over almost daily no one can do that for you i can tell you about them i can tell you what they mean but you have to apply them to your own life the good news of the gospel is my chains fell off i've been set free and we join him in his new life and just as christ was raised from the dead that we might too walk in a newness of life we pass from death to life we have a new identity that has power and the motivation to obey God and long to do the will of God for the glory of God. And the result of all this is in verse 3. For the time has already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, and drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Interesting, is it not, that people don't change? Satan may change all the labels and he may look at different than it did now on the outside, but on the inside it's all the same. Sin is sin. Since the Garden of Eden, people have not changed. Sin is still sin. We may be drinking out of bottles instead of wine flasks. We may be going to the nice hotels instead of the back alleys to be immoral. But people haven't changed. And he's describing here these people he's writing to their life before they came to Christ. It was not the good old life. It was a life of sin and brokenness and misery, of using people and debauchery. And he's comparing here what they are to what they were, that there has been a change, a powerful change, a magnanimous change, an, un, an undeniable change in their life. And it's sad that so many people look, you hear testimonies sometimes, that people look back at their life before they came to Christ, especially if they're older, and it's almost like they're, they're sad that they, that they had to give it up. And it's almost like the good old days. But it not, was not the good old days. If you had died, you would have died and gone to a Christless eternity. You were leading others down that same path. It was a life separate from God of misery, of heartache, of using other people, brokenness. And Peter reminds us that it would be most unreasonable if it were not to change the course of our life after having been enlightened by Jesus Christ. It would be most unusual for the life not to change from this, from chapter 3 to verse, verse 3 to chapter, verse 2. It would be virtually impossible. Christ changes your life. There is a distinction here between the time of ignorance and the time of faith, as though, it had, as though he had said that it was right that they should become new and different men from the time that Christ called them. And that's what Christ does. We're called out of darkness into light, from blindness into sight, from death to life, from bondage to freedom. And it says in verse 4, they are shocked, and maybe some of you have experienced this, in all this, they, cannot, they are surprised that you do not run with them to the same excess of dissipation. They cannot believe that they can't get you to go along anymore. They can't believe that you're so changed, that you're so different. And that's implying that there was obviously a, a tremendous change in the lives of the people Peter's writing to, and I'm sure there was a tremendous change in your life as well if you came to Christ out of this kind of a lifestyle. Your friends don't understand you. They think it's strange. They malign you because you won't go along. 
You won't join them in their revelry and their drunkenness and their parties and their orgies and everything else. They can't believe it. Why won't you become, why won't you be part of us? Join us. But there's something has changed in here, isn't it? You want no part of that anymore. That which once you were drawn to has been broken. One writer has said, I think it was Spurgeon, he said, what a strange world this is. It speaks evil of men because they will not do evil. It's not about the world we're living in. Yet it has always been so. The men of whom the world was not worthy have been the very people of whom the ungodly have said, away with such people from the earth. It is not fit that they should live. And that's what they did to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to God's own Son, the perfect, righteous, sinless Son of God. Away with Him. Crucify Him. And then he closes with this. The world's verdict concerning Christians is of little value. Remember that. The world's verdict concerning you means nothing. It's what Christ says about you that matters. Their day of reckoning is coming. For the gospel, for this purpose, or verse 5, for they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Their day of reckoning is coming. Their day of reckoning is coming. And the day of reckoning is coming for every man unless you turn and repent of your sin and come to Christ. One day we're all going to give an account. And the only ones who are going to enter into the joy of the Lord into heaven are those who have, not because they're the worst, the best people, or the most righteous people, no. The ones who go to hell aren't the most sinful people. But they're still in their sin. They're still in their sin. We go to heaven because of the righteousness of Christ and Christ alone. We go to heaven because our sins have been forgiven. The debt has been paid by Jesus Christ. And we stand before God and we claim, listen, why should I let you into my heaven? We say, because Jesus died for me and I've trusted him as my Lord and my Savior and I, he's in my heart, he's in my life and I love him. And I'm standing before you clinging to the merits of Christ's righteousness alone. That's why I should get into heaven. I don't have done nothing to deserve heaven. Nothing. But I'm trusting in Christ and his merits to get me into heaven. That's the Christian. We understand that. And that's why we love Christ and live for him. Peter's point in verse 6 is a little veiled in some respects. It's kind of hard to understand it. But he's simply saying that believers, even under unjust treatment, he's talking about those, no doubt, who have died before he wrote this letter, who have died already died because of persecution. And they've been treated unjustly that we should be willing to, and unafraid to suffer, knowing that death, all death can do is triumphantly bring us home to be with our Heavenly Father in heaven. That they may have been judged by wicked men and were by them condemned to die, but they are a far more glorious life now than they ever lived here. That's a glorious hope that we all have. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Are you armed for such a battle? Are you armed for a spiritual battle with spiritual truth, with the Spirit living inside of you, filling you day in and day out? Spiritual power, spiritual desires? Or do you even care about the battle? If I've, I've, we've had people leave our church because I preached this, that we can be free from sin. Who would leave a church because somebody tells you you can be free, you're no longer slaves to sin? That should be the greatest news we've ever heard, unless we love sin, and we don't want to be free from it. We want an excuse to continue in it. I couldn't help it. But the good news of the gospel is Christ has delivered us from the dominion of sin. Satan has been defeated. We are given a new creation, a new nature, and sin shall no longer have dominion over us. Are you armed for the battle? Do you even care about the battle? If there's no battle in your heart between flesh and the spirit, you need to ask yourself if you are in fact a believer at all. No unjust persecution by an ungodly world can steal the believer's victory. 
All suffering for righteousness' sake has, been, has a perfecting power. It increases spiritual strength. It humbles us and drives us to prayer. It enriches our reward, and in the event that it costs us our lives, we have reached our ultimate goal and God's ultimate purpose. Hope in Christ in heart when suffering comes, but resolving to step into the next day free from the entitlement of what we thought this life might offer. And this is an important phrase. Free from the entitlement of what we thought this life might offer. Knowing that in Christ, we, are alre we already have the best of this life and the life to come. Christ makes us strong, resolved and determined. He is the bridge between suffering and hope. Don't be surprised by suffering, but be ready to serve for the glory of God. Peter's going to get to that in a few verses, a few chapters, or a few verses from where we are. Are you armed for living the Christian life? Are you guarding your heart? Are you guarding your mind? Are you prepared free? Do you have a mind prepared for actions? He says in chapter 1, verse 13. Are you feeding on the word of God? Are you praying regularly and daily for strength for God to fill you with the spirit? And this world tribulation will come. Christ said, I have overcome the world. We live our Christian life from a position of victory. Stand, therefore, stand clothed with the armor of God. Christ always leads us in triumph, he says in 2.14, 2 Corinthians. Satan is defeated. Satan's power has been broken. His penalty has been paid. And one day we will be free from the very presence of sin. And it will be eliminated as Satan and his angels and all those without Christ will be cast into a Christless eternity in hell and sin will be no more. To close, let me just read some wonderful verses from Paul. The end of his life. He's in prison, basically waiting, waiting to die. But you can see he's still armed. He's still armed for the fight. He's still in this fight. He hasn't given up. Listen to what he says, and may, may you claim this for your own life. Verse 17 of chapter 4. Writing to young Timothy, what wonderful verses these must have been for Timothy to hear. And we need to hear them as well. But the Lord stood with me. Let me read verse 14 with some context to it. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposes our teaching. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against him. Paul was alone. His friends had left. But now notice what he says. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that though through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the mouth of the lion, or the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What a way to end your life. What a way to live your life. And may these, we claim these verses as our own. The Lord will stand with you just as he stood with Paul. And he will strengthen you. And he will rescue you from every evil deed and will bring you safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your work is not in vain. And as he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. God is faithful and he is with you and he will never leave you. So don't lose heart. But continue on in the fight. Fight the good fight of faith to the glory of God and the good of others. Let's look to him in prayer. Father, may you bless these words to our heart today, we pray. And Lord, you don't know, I don't know who's listening to these words, but we pray, Lord, that you might just use them, Lord, to 
encourage, convict, strengthen. Not because they're my words, but, be, but your words from the word of God. May those words penetrate deeply into the heart of each believer. May these truths resonate in our minds and maybe we rejoice. If we're, maybe we're hearing this for the first time. That we have been set free from the dominion of sin. We've been set free. We can have victory over the flesh. We walk in the spirit. We will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We pray, Lord, that we would just understand these principles, these powerful principles, and apply them in our daily walk, in our daily life. That we might find joy, we might find encouragement, that we might have victory, that we might shine as lights in the midst of a wicked, midst of a wicked and perverse generation, that, that when we're mocked, when we're scorned, when we're looked down upon, when we're laughed, snickered at, that we might stand victorious, knowing that the answer is Christ in us, but it's also the answer we, we need to show, show them the difference that Christ makes in our life. They may mock us for not wanting to run along in their wicked lifestyles, but as we don't walk, they also watch, and they see a difference, they see a change. And we can have the opportunity to share the hope that we have in Christ and give an answer for that hope. And so, Lord, may we recognize that we're going to win this world to Christ not by becoming like it, but by living a life that's different. It's Christ-like. It's pursuing holiness and godliness through Christ living in us. So bless us, we pray. And there's some watching this who've never known, come to know Christ yet as their Savior. I pray that you might just open their hearts and their minds and see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that they might see Realize that Christ came into this world to die on a cross for sin, to pay a debt of sin, our debt, a debt that we could not pay. We were guilty and deserving of hell, deserving of eternal punishment. And God laid on Jesus Christ the iniquities of us all. He paid our debt, he paid our price, and we've been forgiven in Christ, but we're only, that only, we can only appropriate that through faith. By grace through, alone, through faith alone in Christ alone, not of works. We cannot earn it. We cannot merit it. It's a gift of grace. And may we just, if there's someone listening to this who's never come to Christ, may they just say, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. I need mercy. Save me. I believe you died for me, and I want to live my life for you. I thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, and I want to give my life to him, and I want to serve him. Thank you for all you've done for me. And as I learn about you, may I continue to grow and love Christ more and more every day. Thank you. You've delivered me from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and one day from the very presence of sin. Thank you that you love me in Christ. And I give you my life. And I want to serve you with my life. And from that moment on, you become a new creation in Jesus Christ. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's a gift of grace. Bless this word to our heart, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. God bless you.